Well, I guess we'll go ahead and get started, and if others join us along the way, that's fine. And of course, we have lots of folks who do watch us in recording, too, so everyone's watching recording. Um, hello, it's great to, great to see you all as well. And just a reminder, <clears throat> we are going to have some discussion later on in the session, but if you're watching this recorded and you want to participate in ongoing discussion, you can always jump on our uh, Facebook group for the Spinoza Havera. We're always up for more conversation there. But for today, our topic at hand is discussing really the first of two sessions that's going to be talking about life cycle rituals in Judaism. This one is, is going to focus mostly on weddings and bar mitzvah, or be mitzvah, but I also wanted to actually talk about more generally some issues about ritual more generally as well. But before we did do that, I did think this is a good point. We are, we are nearing the end of this class, a few months um, months to go before we reach the end of this class. So there'll be a good check-in point just to see how folks are feeling about the class. How are you doing in your journey? Um, and especially also if um, just any questions you have, thoughts you have. Um, I'm also really curious if folks have thoughts about what do we do after this class ends? Do we want to continue to meet like this? Do we want to do something else? I mean, there's all kinds of possibilities, but I just wanted to throw it open for a few minutes of conversation if anyone has thoughts about um, how it's been going thus far, but also where we'd like to, to, to see it go. And Laurie, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, I don't think I really have the capacity to keep going on as regular a basis as before. Um, but what I, I was born from Jewish parents. They raised us, you know, atheist and totally remote from that and even went to Unitarian Sunday schools. And I had to kind of come back and I'm not, you know, a Jew by choice in the sense of coming from some other, you know, identity, but I um, would like to do some kind of like reconnection ceremony in, or something like that, you know, the kind of uh, affirmation or something, not the same thing as a, you know, adoption ceremony, but I don't know something, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. I think that would be wonderful, and I think that's very doable. Um, Martin and I have talked about that some, in particular, some ideas about that. And one of the ideas we had was doing sort of a, um, for any students who want to do this, doing sort of either an adult be mitzvah or a confirmation type of service. And the idea would be that you would prepare um, a short talk on some, on some topic of interest that you care about, and you present it at a service, but we would also have a little bit of ritual involved too. So one of the things in a, in a more traditional Jewish context is people get called to the Torah. And there's, there's this kind of special song that's in, involved of, of, of calling someone up with their, by their Hebrew name. And so I think Martin is working a little bit on that, on the lit liturgy of it, but I think that would be definitely something we could do. So I'm excited to hear you want to do that. And I'm going to Actually, make a note of that so that I can pass that on to Martin if that's something you want to do. So, what else? What do other folks have are thinking? You know, one thing that um, occurs to me is that we're we've learned quite a bit about Jewish culture. I wonder if we would benefit from. Um, like a class on Jewish cooking, um, mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, uh, I mean, just kind of as a fun thing, not as necessarily like a serious thing, but like both, uh, uh, or, you know, not both, but uh, Ashkenazi, Sephardic, Mizrahi, if, if there's any way that that could be incorporated, I think that would be kind of fun because I've tried to look up different recipes and things and include them in the holiday dinners that I prepare for my family. So, um, you know, Jewish cooking might be something that could be in incorporated later. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Would be fun too. That would bring in also people. You know, everyone has different interests. And I think like people like my wife. Um, I think she would get drawn into. She would love to be in a class like that, for instance. And I think a lot of us are really drawn to food as an important part of our cultural and identity. So I, I love that idea. And we could even invite guest speakers or guest you know, um, uh, guess, I don't know, teachers for that subject or really for others as well. Um, oh, I like, I think the work that you and, and Martine have done has been, uh, has been spectacular and I've been really grateful for it, but I think that it would be beneficial to consider, 
having uh, you know guest instructors as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, we can get the word out in the broader Jewish world that we're looking for some guest speakers uh, on this topic, and I think that would we we'd probably find some. I mean, I, I took my first uh, uh, Judaism Unbound um, on Yeshiva course recently, and it was just really cool to be able to introduce. It, the whole time I was in the class, I kept thinking about Martin and thinking about him being Sephardic because it was it was the class on, you know, um, Sephardic and Mizrahi identities and how like they're marginalized compared to Ashkenazi. Um and uh, and the whole time I was thinking of him, of course, and I like I I liked that you know it was somebody that had had studied the subject and had spent a considerable amount of time on it. Um, you know, I also know that there are people in in the class that have become somewhat knowledgeable about different topics regarding Judaism or have life experiences that they could share uh, mm -hmm. that that might be valuable for us to have as contributions. Anyway, that's just some of my thoughts. Well, one thing I'm kind of hearing, and others can say if this appeals to you or not, but I'm, I'm almost inclined to think we maybe we need to think about having some ongoing adult education classes, but they not necessarily be a, like a whole course necessarily, but they could be short things. So it could be maybe three or four sessions on a certain area of Jewish cooking or a few sessions on, I think of all things, kinds of topics. And we have so many interesting people we could pull in to guest speak. And so I I think it'd be great. Uh, shorter, also shorter is less of a commitment to it. You can you could sign on. I could see signing on for that three session thing. And I would be unwilling to to donate money, you know, for that, you know, mm -hmm. you're doing through the energy of getting these people and getting this together, you know, and putting your time into it, you know. Oh, that's tremendous. Okay. I'm dropping that. That's a very good idea. Also, we have in the chat a few things. Uh, Gabrielle says, my voice is a bit raspy, so I might be writing. I would love to continue meeting as long as possible. That alongside the Shabbat slash festival. And then Heather wrote, yes, classes about cooking would be interesting. Okay, well, this is really helpful. I'll, I'll get with uh, Martine. And we'll we'll have some more conversations about what might we might be doing starting in the fall. Um, I'm liking personally my idea of I would love for us to continue having classes of some kind about as often as we are now, but not necessarily doing the the same thing every. You know, there's this year we really wanted to have kind of a introduction class so that and especially wanted to record it frankly so that anyone who's coming in could always who's wanting to engage more Jewishly getting started, they would have this whole library of classes they could watch and get themselves oriented to some extent. But I think in the future, I think for next year, I'm leaning more in the direction of uh, still having a lot of classes, but them being having more guest speakers, having more topics, and maybe shorter to like three classes or even some single classes. Um, so I think there's a lot of possibilities. So. Anyway, thank you everyone for giving some input on this. It's really helpful. But also, if you have any thoughts after this, uh, don't hesitate. Please email Martin or myself. Uh, it'd be very helpful. So, well, for today, I thought we'd begin. I have a few videos we'll walk through a little bit. But first, I wanted us to have a, a bit of a conversation about ritual. And especially, what does it mean for humanistic Jews? I think there is a perception that many people have is that ritual is something that traditional people do. Orthodox Jews, they have tons of rituals, but humanistic Jews, we don't do that. And I don't think that's accurate. And I think most many humanistic Jews would also push back on that as well. But I do think sometimes, even for humanistic Jews who value ritual, <laughs> are sometimes uneasy about it or are, are afraid that by engaging in ritual, particularly more traditional ones, that somehow it's negating the humanistic element. And I don't agree with that, but I would like to unpack that a little more as a group. Um, since we're a smaller group today, I don't know if we'll do it in breakout groups necessarily. Um, we could, but I wanted to just maybe open it up for a little bit of discussion. We might do some breakout rooms later, but for now, I thought we might open it up for some discussion about, really, I got 
a couple of questions I'd like for us to mull over. One is, why do human beings engage in rituals? And also, how do we define what is a ritual? And does a ritual have to be religious or not? So who would have some thoughts on that question about why do we do rituals and what exactly is a ritual? A wedding requires one of some sort. This is actually make one of my... Oh, go ahead. To make meaning. Um, okay. To uh, this is actually one of my favorite topics. A ritual is something that I'm that's really important to me, and why I was drawn to Judaism. Um, uh, rituals are one of the most important things I feel like we do as a society. We do actually a lot of them without knowing that we do them. But it's um it's it's to make meaning, like David said, but it's also to convey meaning and to uh, to pass it along to future generations. Um, it's to uh, I like what Gabrielle said to affirm group identity. That's true, but also to 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 be able to convey those things that oftentimes are almost ineffable in words. The things that we the the values, the the ideas, the philosophies, um, and the connections with one another that that we want to pass on um, to others in the group, but also to future generations, as I mentioned before. And it's. Um, it's it, it creates a language that is understandable by multiple people and with multiple meanings. The term is polyvalence, and it's got it's a it's a polyvalent way of of conveying lots of different meanings uh, for for different things, and, and almost kind of in a very efficient manner. And more specifically for life cycle rituals, um, usually a way of marking transitions, like birth, coming of age, marriage, death, et cetera. Yeah, um, creating occasions of joy and celebration um, and uh, um, uh, mar uh, marking them as special. Now, are, are, are rituals always religious, or do they function in other contexts as well? I mean, definitely in lots of different contexts. I mean, for example, we shake hands when we greet, greet one another. That's, mm -hmm. that's a ritual. Yeah, I was going to say, not rituals necessarily could just be like anything. Like, for example, you get up at 7 a.m. every day to, you know, brush your teeth and, you know, take a shower. It could be like simple things like that, too. Like, you know, health rituals or, you know, stuff like that, too. Mm -hmm. Non religious um, life cycle rituals like graduation from um, school. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's one life cycle ritual that you almost always have to have in some form, and that's the marriage one. Mm -hmm. All the others you could do nothing if you wanted and still make it happen or, you know, we'd still, whatever. You'd become 13, you'd become, you'd die, you'd whatever. But to get married, they make you do something. <laughs> Very minimal, but you got to do something. When you, become an, when you become an American citizen, um, they have to go through, a, take a test, and then they have to do some sort of, I guess, pledge where they have to affirm allegiance. So that's like in front of a judge or something like that. Yeah. And that's a ri important ritual. And yeah. voting is kind of a ritual, although it's not thought of it that way. But when you go and vote, you feel like it's something almost sacred. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some, and what's interesting is some of the rituals, like I think the marriage is a great example where that you see certain elements. You see two people making promises to each other, making verbal commitments. Often there's other things around that other blessings or other ritual actions, lighting candles, doing this, doing that. But then also there's a moment where an officiant who 
is either who may be representing the state, who may be representing a religious community, then pronounces the couple married. And at that point, then they, by the speaking of the word, something, you know, theoretically, magically happens. And now this person's status has changed. Um, I find that super interesting. Like, why is it that, that this invoking of words in this context makes something happen? If you said those exact same words in different contexts, it would nothing would happen. So there's certainly an intentionality element to so many of these rituals. A lot of a lot of it has to do with the meaning that you put into it too, because like when Mary and I got married, we were we got married as soon as we were legally allowed to in 2014, and it was with the mm-hmm. justice of the peace. It wasn't a religious ceremony at all. It was before a judge in a little courthouse, but yet it felt so sacred to do this. Even though it's to anyone looking at it, it would just be this routine justice of the peace thing, not even religious. Mm-hmm. Oh, I remember when when uh, same sex marriage first became legal, and just what joy! I mean, I just I just kept looking at pictures online of friends I knew that were getting married, and the press accounts, and especially I remember when the, when San Francisco first legalized it briefly. And and before the Supreme Court did their ruling, and just the the surge of people going to the going to city hall to get married, and what joy there was, even though these were very simple simple ceremonies, there was not time or resources to have anything elaborate, and yet they were they were deeply meaningful. And I know people that have, who have participated in them have said it was really a magical moment. It occurs to me that we have we do have some rituals for sad times, like of course memorial services, funerals. But some things we don't, like, example, um, hopefully I'll never be in this situation, but friends of mine have, that if someone gets divorced, there's no real ritual, no real way to kind of mark that transition. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up, because one of the things I wanted to do this morning, and I actually, I'm glad I got to my outline, so we're going to talk about this right now are some of the creative resources available for non-traditional ritual needs. And so I'm going to share screen momentarily. Okay, so let me, I'm going to pull up real quick a website, and this is from, this website is from the Reconstructionist Movement of Judaism, which in many ways has a lot of common ground with the humanistic movement, but this website is called RitualWell.org, and what is fascinating about this website is that you can submit your, in fact, here's the link, submit a ritual (laughs) right there, Uh, but they are rituals for all kinds kinds of things. And so, for instance, I'm just going to click on a few of the options. Under life cycles, they have becoming a Jewish adult. And you click on that, it's B'nai Mitzvah, getting driver's license, first menstruation, graduation, leaving home. Uh, under, uh, we'll say, ending relationships, there's ones for divorce and separation. For gender and sexuality, there's ser- rituals for coming out and gender transitioning. Um, all kinds of possibilities. But also for all kinds of everything from healing and hard times to everyday kind of rituals. I, I, one of the reasons I, I recently, very recently, a few months ago, was consulted this when my uh, beloved dog died, who I was very close to, had been a big part of my life for quite a while. And I reached out to my reform rabbi saying, I know that, you know, you don't traditionally recite Kaddish for a dog, but I really, I feel a great deal of grief and I want to do something. She suggested I turn to ritual well, and in fact, I'm going to do a search for uh, losing a pet. No, that's not it. Uh, they're popping up everything. Okay, let's see. This thing's probably while you're, um, while you're sure. uh, doing this, James, I'll just mention for the, the people in the room, if they don't know this already, there's quite a few in here written by Martine, actually. There are. Yeah, so here's just when I searched for pet, I found ritual and prayer upon adopting and naming a pet, grieving the loss of a pet, passing the beloved pet, 
or critically ill pet, these are there's a really, really good ritual here. And here's one of saying goodbye to a beloved pet when you have to uh, euthanize an animal. Just some really useful stuff. And I bring this up to say that it gives us a lot of, it shows us that we can be playful. We can be creative and thinking about rituals and that there's so many possibilities. So anyway, so I want to now transition a little over to talking about some a few specific kinds of life cycle rituals. And those are weddings and be mitzvah. So I'm going to go ahead and I have a video first. And these are topics that are huge and we could go into a whole lot of time on. I'm Today, I'm really looking at surface level stuff for the nature of this class. And so this first video is all about what are why are Sephardic and Ashkenazi weddings so unique? And what I like about this video, it really builds into the cultural differences, but also of more traditional types of weddings. So I do want, before I show this, though, to say that weddings... Traditionally, Judaism is focused a lot on weddings. I'd have to say for myself at this point in life, I am not convinced it is the only or the best way to organize human relationships necessarily. And so I have kind of mixed feelings about that, honestly, the focus on weddings and whatnot. And so I would really just would like to say I'm not, I'm not hung up on saying that everyone needs to be married or that's a necessarily a positive thing to promote necessarily. But I do think it is a common, it is something that many humans do, and that's that, that's what it is. So anyway, so let's, um, anyway, we'll watch this video and then we'll have some time to talk about it. And after that, we have another set of videos to watch. So, When you hear Jewish wedding, you might envision the horror, a chupa, a smash glass. And sure, most, if not all Jewish weddings incorporate those traditions. Mazel tov. But here's the thing about Jews. We're diverse and we've developed lots of different traditions over time. This is a Sephardi bride preparing for her wedding. And this is an Ashkenazi bride. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. So what are the major differences between Ashkenazi and Sephardi weddings? Number one, the Ashkenazi Afraf versus the Sephardi Shabbat Chatan. Think a wedding is a one night only affair? One night only. Think again. Oh, well, I guess that's cool. On the Shabbat before the wedding, Ashkenazim host an Afraf for the groom, inviting him to recite the blessings before the Torah reading. Meanwhile, the bride's family and friends host a Shabbat Kala, or bridal Shabbat, with sweets and treats in her honor. Since many Ashkenazi couples follow a tradition of not seeing each other the week before the wedding, this Shabbat is a good chance for them to spend quality time with their friends and family. Some Sephardi couples continue to see each other the week before the wedding. Plus, the Sephardi groom is honored at the Shabbat after the wedding, with his new wife by his side. This Shabbat is called the Shabbat Chatan, the groom's Shabbat, so some people call it the Avram sees, a nod to the special Torah reading where Avram seeks a wife for his son. Whether the groom is Ashkenazi, Sephardi, or a mix, the groom is sure to be pelted with candies after he recites the blessing to represent a sweet future. Number two, the mikveh, private or party? The ritual preparations don't end there. A few days or even the night before the wedding, Jewish brides visit a ritual bath called the mikveh. Ashkenazi communities generally treat this as a private moment. Usually, only the bride's mother or mother-in-law accompany her. For Sephardi women, however, the first dip in the mikveh is a full-on rite of passage, and they celebrate it as such. In Ladino, it's known as La Noche de la Novia, the night of the sweetheart, or Baño de la Novia, the bath of the bride. The mikveh party is an all-women celebration, complete with festive songs and trays full of sweet maltipan cookies, dates, fruits, and nuts galore. Historically, this was a night of drinking, drumming, and dancing, when married women would convey advice to the new bride through movement and music. It's a wonderful chance for the bride to celebrate this moment of transition with the women in her life. And many Ashkenazi Israeli brides have adopted the festivities as well. Number three, the Sephardi henna celebration. Good God, man. Stop eating those, you're gonna blow up. No, I'm not. The numbers on the scale just Keep on going down, bro. James stepped what? away. What? <laughs> How are you losing weight? I've been trying this new drink every morning. It's totally natural, and yeah, makes you pee out fat. Oh, that no. sounds made up. Sorry. No, doctors at Yale School of Medicine <laughs> figured out how to flip a metabolic switch oh, yeah, in your liver cells, and, uh... and it liquefies hard fat in your belly, legs, no, and hips. Not one here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Right before the wedding, many Sephardic <laughs> communities throw a henna party. It's a celebration that really has no equivalent among Ashkenazi. We, we don't really do that. 
It's a time for family and friends to bless the bride and groom, to wish them health, good luck, fertility, and to protect them against the evil eye. Exact rituals vary widely among communities, but you can expect plenty of music, dancing, and lots of food. I'm talking Yemenite jahnun and malawa, sweet Moroccan maltipan cookies, Iraqi haji bada almond cookies. The couple typically dresses according to their community's traditional attire, from the Yemenite tashbuk headdress to the Moroccan fez hat to the Indian sari. Each community has different traditions. There's a Yemenite custom for the grandmothers of the bride and groom to circle a fresh egg around the couple's heads to bless them with fertility. During Moroccan henna parties, the couple invites someone whose marriage they admire to apply their henna. Kurdish Jews customarily henna a small boy and girl to serve as decoys for the bride and groom in order to confuse the evil eye. And the Bene Israel Indian Jewish community's Mendi ceremony, which includes a variety of symbolic objects, like a seven-wicked lamp for protection, rice for fertility, candies for a sweet marriage, coconut for nourishment, and coins for prosperity. Suffice to say, it's quite the party. Number four, fasting versus feasting. Not only do Sephardim and Ashkenazim prepare differently before the wedding, but they also have an entirely different approach to the wedding day itself. The Talmud states that when a couple gets married, their sins are forgiven if they go through a process of repentance. Ashkenazim interpret this to mean that the wedding day is a personal Yom Kippur of the bride and groom, a day of atonement. And what do we do on Yom Kippur? We fast. Nothing for you. Unlike on Yom Kippur, the bride and groom only fast from sunrise till after the wedding ceremony. Like on Yom Kippur, the couple recites a special vidui or confession, and the groom wears a white cotton robe called a kittle that evokes a burial shroud to remind him that life is fleeting. When the bride and groom stand under the chuppah and bind themselves to each other, they transform from two individuals into a new, complete soul. It's a weighty moment, one that the two need to approach seriously, making sure that they are as holy and pure as possible. There's also a more practical reason for fasting. In order for a Jewish marriage to be legit, the couple has to consent with full awareness. My eyes were wide open. So no last minute vodka shots for the Ashkenazi groom getting cold feet. Sephardim, on the other hand, interpret the Talmud statement differently. Yes, the wedding day is an opportunity for repentance, but that's a reason to celebrate. For Sephardim, the wedding is not a day of solemn consideration of one's deeds. It's a day when the bride and groom are supposed to enjoy a nice meal and pray enthusiastically. Number five, veiling and unveiling. <laughs> you would think the ceremony itself would be pretty consistent across Jewish communities, right? Well, think again. While all traditional Jewish weddings follow the same basic formula, different communities add or subtract various customs, like the Ashkenazi Bedeken. Before the chuppah ceremony officially begins, the Ashkenazi groom's friends and family dance him over to his bride, who is sitting on a special chair or throne. The groom greets his bride and then places a veil over her face, and she remains veiled until the end of the ceremony. The custom harks back to biblical times, when Jacob was tricked by his father-in-law into marrying the wrong sister. In order to prevent any confusion from happening again, the groom checks that the woman before him is in fact his bride and places the veil on her himself. In Sephardi weddings, the equivalent of the Vedekin ceremony happens here. As the bride walks down the aisle, the groom meets her halfway. There he places the veil over her and then together they walk to the chuppah. Number six, the chuppah. The chuppah is one of the most visually familiar symbols of a Jewish wedding. But even the chuppah has differed between Sephardi and Ashkenazi communities. The chuppah represents the couple's home, historically, the groom's home that he would bring his bride into. While Ashkenazim have always used a physical structure as the chuppah, Sephardim have a custom where the groom wraps his bride with his talit. According to many Sephardi rabbis, this act of bringing her into his space actually counts as the chuppah. Still, many Sephardim do use the four-poled structure today as well. Number seven. Time alone, together. The ceremony ends. The groom steps on the glass, and all the guests shout, Mazel Tov. Among song and dance, the Ashkenazi bride and groom usually go off to a room by themselves, the Yichud room, where they share a private moment. There, they typically break their fast and embrace for the first time as a married couple. Well, that's a first. Sephardim, on the other hand, they prefer to keep their private time, well, private. Reserving the couple's alone time for the end of the night. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Either way, both Ashkenazi and Sephardi couples will spend the rest of the night in a full-on party. This is truly the time for each community to shine with their own unique dances and music. 
from the Hasidic mitzvah tans to the Yemenite step to the Mazinka and everything in between, a wedding is the pinnacle of cultural expression. It's no wonder that Sephardi and Ashkenazi weddings often look so different. Even the term Sephardi is a catch-all term with tons of distinct groups with distinct customs within it. With so many different traditions, it's impossible to define what any single Ashkenazi or Sephardi wedding might look like. And whereas once upon a time, weddings between Ashkenazim and Sephardim were actually considered intermarriage, oh, scandalous! Today, Sephardim and Ashkenazim from all backgrounds unite and find unique ways to blend each of their family's traditions, adding even more beauty to the Jewish wedding. Stressed about your Okay. Okay. So what are some thoughts from watching that video? I mean, I was really struck by just how how different the, the traditions are. I, I knew they were somewhat different. I didn't know they were this different. Um, what do y'all think? What, what were some of the things that jumped out at you from, from the, this video? I um, have a question that I was hoping would be answered by the, by the video. And that, that was, why do they step on the glass? I've heard it said it was it's out of mourning for the destruction of the temple. It's kind of recognition that even at the moment of happiest joy, there's still this recognition that we're that our joy is incomplete. Is what I've heard, but yeah. I I don't know. Can, it's, I don't I don't know if that's for sure or not. That's just what I've heard. It's bitter and sweet in life, you know, but happy now. It there, there are different different ways of looking at this. There's the with happiness. There, there's always there's always some sadness in life. That there's the the happy and the sad is life. That that's a mm -hmm. part, of, and that sort of acknowledges it. That's that's one uh, one interpretation. I, I think there is even though we were all taught. I think about the the destruction of the temple. I don't think that's codified anywhere. That meaning. I think that that. Uh, yeah, I just read yeah. a whole thing about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I like what Betty and what you said about it being really broader than that. And I, I think that's, I, I kind of like the, it's a, the acknowledgement that marriage is not necessarily going to be easy. And I, I know, I think that's a good message. I think that, I don't know, from a lot of young people that I've worked with in, 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 do, as in, in the process of officiating weddings for them, so many of them are focused so much on the wedding and it's like, yeah, this is one day of your life. It's an awesome day and it's, it's great to celebrate it, but it's really one day of a whole marriage and there's a lot more past there. So to me, the glass, to me, is a recognition just, it's not all, and, and there's also a sense of loss. Um, you know, getting married means that to some extent, you're not completely as autonomous as you once were, that there are pluses of being single too and, and that recognizing the transition also means mourning the parts of the your old life that you're giving up so oh gabrielle posted in venezuela most of both sephardic and ashkenazi have incorporated the venezuelan crazy hour or a loca at midnight oh i like that does that happen uh, if you can put it in the chat later, does that happen before or after? Like, is that the midnight after the wedding or the midnight before? I'm assuming it's after, probably. Yeah, I'm just that. That 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 sounds awesome. Well, our next set of videos, and we can come back to this and discuss it more. But I do. Our next set of videos is on a very different. Uh, different kind of ritual, and this is looking at bi mitzvah. Um, and bi mitzvah is, by the way, a term that I think I'm not sure if it's coined by the humanistic movement or not, but it certainly has become the default term in the, in the humanistic movement for bar and and uh, bat mitzvah. And the issue being is that how can we describe um, the ceremony in a gender um, inclusive way, recognizing non-binary people, but also just recognizing that. Is there fundamentally anything different about a male coming of age versus a female coming of age? And so this B mitzvah <laughs> is been, been used as a new term to describe um, this kind of ceremony. And in the humanistic movement, you know, traditionally what a barabat mitzvah, barabat mitzvah looks like is 
is it's, it's simply a ceremony to recognize the coming of age. So a Jewish person, when they reach the age of 13 or an Orthodox circle, 12 for women, but I think all the other movements largely it's 13 across the board, that you automatically, by virtue of reaching this age, have reached this status of, of Jewish adulthood, sort of kind of theoretically. But the ceremony is a way of recognizing that coming of age. What's um, and traditionally um, what was the main thing, main focus of a be, of a be mitzvah was the reading of Torah, particularly in in um, and today in liberal circles of all kinds, uh, boys and girls read from Torah. In Orthodox circles, it's only males that read from Torah. Females, if they got get to read anything, it might be the um, um, the prophetic books or something else. And often it will not be on Shabbat for, for our girls. But in more liberal progressive circles of Judaism, there's not a gender difference. Beyond that, of course, there's lots of things that have been added to this ritual besides just being called the Torah for the first time. So often it might include the young person leading quite a bit of the service, but it also often includes a party. And there's been, of course, controversy about that. Some people say it's the focus has become too much on the party, but others have argued that the party actually is often the young person where they are expressing their desires, their interests in ways that the, the service may not, but the party might. So there's different ways of looking at it. But I thought to give you an idea, though, just looking at it from most of us are familiar with what more traditional contexts do, either from attending a, uh, a B mitzvah or from watching one on TV in a TV show. But I thought it'd be interesting to look at what humanistic B mitzvah look like. And so the city congregation of New York, they have a, a series of videos. It looks like about eight, nine minutes total. There's six short videos that are from some of their recent B mitzvah ceremonies. So I'm going to play this next and then we'll have some time for discussion. So let me do the share screen again. And then I'll jump over. All right, Julie. I don't want that part. There we go. Okay, so here we go. Thank you, this is so beautiful. From birth to death, from cradle to grave, we mark the passage of life. These moments of transition and transformation are universal. They are part of the human existence. We mark this journey in stages, from infancy to youth, from youth to young adulthood, from school to work to retirement, to parenthood perhaps, and grandparenthood, to old age, and then, of course, death. That final stage, which can come at any point along the way. We enter this world with naming ceremonies and initiation rites. We depart with funeral rites and memorials. Along the way, some mark birthdays, graduations, weddings, partnerships, anniversaries with other ceremonies and commemorations. In traditional Jewish culture, children have been, felt, have been held fully accountable for their own deeds when they become 13 and assume religious and legal obligations according to the ancient Jewish law. They are now called a bar or bat mitzvah, literally the son or daughter of the commandments. As humanistic Jews, we recognize the transition to adulthood is a work in progress. As teenagers mature into young adults, and their parents, in turn, entrust them with even greater responsibilities of adulthood. For humanistic Jews, mitzvot are the self-imposed commandments, obligations or good deeds that we place upon ourselves as individuals and collectively as a community. Because we believe that we are the authors of our own lives, it is up to us to set our own guidelines for behavior and to decide how we will act and what values we will uphold. Becoming a bar or bat mitzvah means taking on more and more that responsibility and accountability for oneself and as a member of the community.
instruction is to stir up the minds of the young. Not to give them a definite amount of knowledge, but to inspire a fervent love of truth. Not to impose upon them arbitrary rules automatically passed down from generation to generation, but to awaken the conscience to moral discernment, personal choice, and the freedom of dissent, even from family tradition. The purpose of religious instruction is to educate rather than indoctrinate, to inspire rather than insulate, so that our children will bear themselves with dignity and high purpose. Then they will truly be proud of themselves. Where do our teachings come from? What are the sources of our wisdom? We have a wealth of resources to draw upon. We find teachings in modern literature, poetry, and drama, as well as academic and scientific journals that address contemporary situations and challenges. We draw lessons from the experiences of our own families and our own lives. And you shall proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. Let nation not lift up sword against nation, nor let them study war no more. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? And then if I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? It is to obvious truths and early observations. If you lie down with the dogs, you get up with the fleas. Persecution has taught us about resilience, survival, and community, and anxiety, and fear. Exile and immigration have taught us about sacrifice, continuity, and change, and also assimilation. Israel teaches us about the need for a just and peace. The lessons are mixed. There is no one source of our wisdom. There is no single source of truth. We search for wisdom everywhere. is a link in a chain that stretches all the way back to those ancient ancestors. Just as my parents and my grandparents have tried to pass on certain values and beliefs to me, it will be my responsibility to pass on values and beliefs to the next generation. Becoming a bar mitzvah means that I am now being entrusted to preserve not only my family history, but my people's history, so that it may be remembered by those who come after me to make the next link in the chain. Remember our ancestors with love and respect. From their generation to our generation, we are bound by acts of love. We remember their great deeds with thanksgiving, their acts are our inspiration. May their children and their children's children do honor to their name. <laughs> Hi James. Hi. Uh, would you, would you tell me uh, like your general impression of your experiences at kids' school for the eight years you were there? Well, um, I've been at kids' school, I've been with the congregation since I was born. So I started kids' school in kindergarten and I find that the entire program has been, it has allowed me to get a better understanding of my Jewish, of the Jewish culture of Jewish history, of my Jewish heritage. Um, it has 
allowed me to think deeper about where I came from and what I believe. And I think that it's just been a great process from when I started in kindergarten up to my bar mitzvah, um, up to where I'm helping to teach in the classroom. This is a wonderful experience. It's, um, it allows you to think deeper and it's just makes you feel better about where you come from. Great, thank you. <laughs> the chain of tradition from generation to generation and family to family. The Jewish people have a long history stretching back in time over 3,500 years. The beginning of that history is rooted in the Middle East in the land of ancient Israel. During that period, our ancestors were known first as Hebrews and then as Israelites. Later, when our ancestors took on the name of Jews, they moved to many different countries, including the ancient land of, lands of Babylonia, Greece, and Egypt. In more modern times, Jews moved on to still other countries such as Russia and Germany, Spain, France, South Africa, Australia, China, and the modern state of Israel and the United States. According to our tradition, the history of the Jewish people began as a history of one family, the family of Abraham and Sarah. Over the years, going all the way to our own time, each generation has added a new chapter to that family history. Many important values and beliefs have been passed down from generation to generation. At the same time, many other ideas and practices have been newly developed by each succeeding generation. So, there has been both continuity and change over the centuries. Uh, Marty, what, what do you think the kids that, that go through this, uh, this bar and bat mitzvah process at the city congregation, what, what do they get out of it? I th well, to top it, at the very least, they would get off a great sense of um, accomplishment at having gone through the process and really successfully fulfilling all of the obligations and having a bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah after a couple of years of a lot of hard work, research, study, interviewing people. Uh, many of them, for many of them, I think it uh, also helps them focus their own beliefs in um, uh, humanistic secular Judaism. It was kind of, uh, for many kids, I think it's like an amorphous kind of thing. This is what mommy and daddy do. This is what our family does. But now they're being forced to look at it for them, independent of their parents. And for some of them, it may be the first time uh, that they've actually uh, examined themselves uh, away from their parents and how they feel about their religion. Okay. No, I do not want to watch that. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was not part of the curriculum. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought of it because you mentioned it <laughs> about the whole parties. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so oh, so we have some uh, good stuff in the comment. I was going to mention. So Heather wrote, "I just thought of the movie. You're so not invited to my bar mitzvah." Which, by the way, I do recommend. It's a hysterical movie, uh, starring Adam Sandler about two girls who are best friends have their bar mit bat mitzvahs. And the movie, while it's a comedy, addressed issues that teenagers deal with, such as puberty and having th their own identity uh, and from from their parents. Also, the movie commented the B'nai Mitzvah is about the lavish parties more than the tradition. So anyway, yeah, I was thinking about that, that, that movie too. Um, now, what's interesting was the video we just watched was talking about, it was, it was a series of videos that were talking about the B Mitzvah program at the City Congregation of New York. Now, in the different humanistic Jewish congregations, they all have different ways of doing things. I would say what the city congregation is doing is one of the more common approaches, though, in which is they do it in a cohort fashion. So all of the kids of a certain age do, do the class together. They each work on their own individual projects, but the service they all participate in is a collective thing together. Now, it's interesting in the projects, and, the, and really the focus is on the projects. In, the in a more traditional BMISPA context, the focus is on reading Torah and maybe a service project. But in many of the humanistic congregations, instead, the focus is on doing a presentation or a written paper or an artistic presentation, often based upon either 
a theme that's meaningful to them, but often also looking at uh, heroes, people that they personally admire um, as being a focal point. So what are some things, pos what are some things you see positive, negative about this different way of doing the mitzvah? You know, how does, does this, you know, even if you've never seen one a mitzvah in person at a, in a more traditional context, you've probably seen them on TV, you've probably seen them in movies and whatnot. So what do you think about the way that city congregation does it compared to what maybe other places do? Yeah, I mean, Normally I would feel like there'd be like this whole thing where they'd have to memorize a lot of Hebrew and it might or might not have be a real challenge to do and it might inhibit people from wanting to go through with it and this way it seems like there's more it's more accessible to people to the kids mm -hmm. absolutely I do like the liturgy that the congregation read um, that really emphasized the fact of promoting free thinking and promoting critical thinking and that this is what they're seeking to instill in the young people. And that is a very different vibe than you sometimes get in some settings um, that there is often a bar mitzvah feels like, oh, trying to do a final round of brainwashing before they reach adulthood. Um, and it feels like the humanistic approach is a little more let's equip them for free thinking so they can do their own thinking from here on out. They're not going to just rely upon what their parents or the rabbi says, but they are being empowered to do their own thinking. Part of what turned my dad off from Judaism was the fact his father, who was not very involved in his life otherwise, ordered, kind of ordered him to memorize a bunch of Hebrew. And my dad didn't <laughs> even told the meaning of it really that much. He just was told, you have to memorize this. And it just was meaningless to him. Mm -hmm. He was forced to add, add him. Absolutely. I've heard that from many other people as well. Uh, I think especially generation or so back, that was the everywhere was the, the, the default way that bar and bat mitzvah was done. I, I do think today my uh, boss level reform temple, and I've seen what the kids go through to, to get prepared for there. And I do think it's a lot more emphasis on Yes, learning Hebrew, but also learning the meaning of what you're reading and discuss and really engaging with the text in some way, more meaning, the more significant. And so often I've, I've heard students when they give their their Devar Torah talks, they often will argue with the text and will say, yeah, my text says this, this and this, but I don't agree with that. And no one gives them brief about that uh, because that's kind of seen as that's what you're supposed to do as the bar about next uh, is you're supposed to question of course, my funny, as far as humor goes, my favorite movie or TV show of uh, Bar Mitzvah was in the TV show Weeds. And if you remember, in the, if anyone has seen that whole series, towards the end of the season, um, one the there is a, a boy who was going to Bar Mitzvah, and he uh, his father had died. Um, his father's involved in the drug trade in some way. His father had died. He was Latino. He was being raised. His new stepdad was a Jewish rabbi. So he was, of course, doing bar mitzvah, but at his Devar Torah talk, he basically said, I don't know why I'm doing this. I grew up, my dad is, my real dad is Mexican, and I don't really want to be Jewish anyway. <laughs> and says, so I don't believe in God, and yada, yada, yada. It was hilarious. Uh, and yet, to me, when I watched that, it's like, oh, this kid really gets it. This is what bar mitzvah is about. It's about choosing. And this kid's saying, right now, I'm feeling pretty alienated from the Jewish part of me. Uh, and again, that's that's what it's supposed to be. So... <laughs> anyway, I hope all of this class today, one of the take home messages is I think there's a lot of value in knowing the traditions of knowing the different cultural manifestations those rituals can look like. But at the same time, there's also value in arguing with them, pushing back on them, reinventing them. And so that's one of the things I was hoping for in this class is to have a sense of that there is a fair bit of playfulness. There is a lot we can do with these rituals. So. Yeah. Well, to close our, our time together today, I wanted to open the floor up a little bit for just some thoughts about what are rituals that we would like that we would like to see that we haven't seen yet, or are there rituals that maybe, especially the community, we need to be thinking about of what that would look like. And so, 
um, and also just in your life, if you think of circumstances where you're like, I wish there was a ritual for this. Uh, I thought we'd opened up the floor for that for a few minutes. What? Oh, um, personally, I just wish that it was easier to learn a lot of these. Like, I, I feel like, um, um, I well, I sincerely appreciate all the services and rituals that I've been exposed to through the Spinoza Havara. Um, like, there's there's so much that I want to know about what Jews do on these particular days and. At, at these particular moments in life and it's either the fire hose is opened up or the information <laughs> is like the, the information kind of is like oh you should already know this you know like you yeah. like a, a lot of the writing that i'm finding not all of it but a lot of it is kind of like assumes that you grew up jewish mm -hmm. or like this or or that you you know that you are doing <laughs> a a year of study before conversion and it's really frustrating because like i i don't think that that's a fair assumption even if i were just somebody academically that wanted to know more about judaism like it, it's a, it's kind of difficult it's it's um there are, there are some writings that are kind of an insider's club approach to it and it's and it's a little frustrating because there are other religions there are other cultures where their rituals are not so opaque Um, do you think that has anything to do, Skip, with that the, that Judaism is very diverse and, and you're getting a little overwhelmed by, well, they do it this way over here, they do it this way over here, and there's just, well, this is the yes. way it's done. You know, that might be a little, you know, those of but us I mean, who even, grew up in one particular when, one appreciate, oh, they do it that way over there, but we already know the way they do it over here. And you don't have any centering in that, you know what I mean? Oh, I think you're absolutely right. I think that Paula, like that's that's actually been a big problem. Is is that there's so many different, you know, approaches to it. But even if I like, for example, try to narrow it down to like Ashkenazi traditions, mm -hmm. there's so many like you know the Orthodox do it this way versus the you know the the Reform do it this way. And, and mm -hmm. I I know that this is going to sound silly in a humanistic Jewish setting, you know, context, but. Like I'd like to learn, quote unquote, um, the correct way of doing rituals, and then and then learn how to modify it myself. You know, learn how to learn how what, what's going to be meaningful to me and what it looks like humanistically. Um, and and some of that is really hard. Like I can read about what Shabbat you know means to Jews, and I can read about like that they drink wine and that they you know break bread. But it's difficult for me to, for example, it, it took a long time to stumble upon that you hold the cup up and that and that women are supposed to light the candles and they're supposed to cover their eyes. I, I mean, like some of these things are very basic, but they're taken for granted amongst Jews um, by people who are on the outside looking in. And I, there are moments where like I kind of almost feel like like some of these people writing this want it to be that way. And then there's other times where it's like, uh, you know, this group does it this way, like you said, and this group does it that way. And it's just like, holy cow. <laughs> well, I think the thing to do is to look, <clears throat> to research through modern Orthodox, let's say. <clears throat> so you don't get all the way to the Hasidim, but you, the modern Orthodox would have the most probably understandable right way from your work looking at it possibly doing it i think they would be the people who would you know cover their eyes and they would say all the prayers and they but they wouldn't have add that added extra we're really going to extremes over here thing wouldn't you think so mm -hmm. i guess yeah i don't know we yeah. love candles and never yeah i mean about cover yeah well, our thing is we're we're not as into ritual as you are yeah and mm -hmm. so but we're attracted to certain little things here and there. And as humanists, we can do anything we want, right? <laughs> so we light the candles, but I just say Shabbat Shalom to the candles. You're welcome to the Sabbath. And then when we do the Havdalah candle, we say 
Shalom Shabbat. <laughs> you know, so we're not doing anything that would be considered an actual ritual, a, a, an adopted ritual, traditional, traditional ritual. We're creating our own as we go along, which is what humanists tend to do. Um, yeah. So, but, but, you know, at the supposed to have a raw, you know, especially with Martin, we're creating certain, he's taking the traditional things and re it's having the words be more humanistic. And, yeah. uh, you know, when this cover up was started, there were less of that so much and more like taking the Amidah and making that into a breathing meditation. So it were, new rituals are created in a certain way that we practice together. But as for when you're at home doing your own thing, you know, you could do Obviously, there's no well. There's no. There's no ultimate authority. This is this is important. There's no ultimate authority in Judaism anywhere. Each the, the very strong set, the very Hasidic sects or whatever, have their own little authority person for that sect alone. So there's no overall authority anywhere, and that like probably, a pope, like yeah, a like pope. a pope or or right. even a Bible in the sense. Of, there's a, we have a Bible, but it's not the sense that like in the New Testament, there's a Jesus figure. And that's sort of the authority in a way, I guess. I, I can't really speak for Jesus, for the New Testament, but I'm guessing that in Christianity, there's sort of a focus on, on a kind of authority. Although I don't see anybody practicing that, frankly. <laughs> whatever. But but there, it's true in Judaism, there is no real authority. You really have to go with whatever group you're going with. But if you want to know what the more tradition is, I would go, I would look into Orthodox, modern Orthodox, I think, to get the kind of sense of what Shabbat service looks like, what and the Passover Haggadah, you know, you can there's and there are many, there are many more traditional Passover Haggadah and and yeah. so that. I appreciate that insight. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's kind of it's it's just kind of my personality, and I get frustrated. Yeah, is that absolutely? Um, I uh, like I'm I'm not quite as frummy as to use his term as Martin, but uh, like I I think that that just my personality skews that way, and so like I I want to practice the ritual the way that it's practiced, and so I'm just trying to get my bearings around that. So thank you for. For, first of all, the clarification, and then yeah. for the recommendation. And Martin says he's a pruminist, so he he likes all the traditional traditions, but he doesn't want to say the God prayers with them. So he converts everything to a humanistic wording, but he's more interested, like you are, in traditionally how things are done. I believe. So you might. I don't know. You could either talk to Martin or just pay attention to what he does, and, <laughs> and that might. Help. But but it doesn't help you to see the picture, and you're looking for the picture. You know, you want to see the woman go like that. You want to see how it's done. You want to see them raise the glass. You want to see how it's done. So, uh, you, I'm sure you can find it, but not in one place. <laughs> I think another element is when we talk about tradition. A complicating factor is you have tradition as far as this idea from the past. But you also have tradition as in the sense of what do the majority of people actually do? And I'll give you a great example. And that is right now in diaspora context in North America, the majority of Jewish people end up marrying non-Jews. More people intermarry than not intermarry now. Uh, in other parts of areas is different. But here, intermarriage is extremely common. And yet if you look at Jewish wedding books, they never even talk about that. Or if they do, I, I have a friend right now who is a Christian who is about to get married pretty soon to a Jewish person. And the assumption of the Jewish family is like, oh, of course, yeah, well, we can do make this work. But it's basically eliminating her. It's like there's no Christian elements at all. There's no it's nothing about her background. It's all about his background. And I told her, I said, look, you got to stand up for yourself. You're kind of not not to be pushy. But I told her, says, you're setting up your marriage in a bad way, because if you let your wedding be bullied in this way. It's not setting things up well in marriage. And so I would argue, for instance, that while the tradition is built upon, for instance, um, in non, you know, key Jewish people marrying each other, and that's what the ritual is based on, the reality of it is, is the majority of Jewish people in the U.S. are marrying across those lines. And so what is traditional may change very dramatically in the next 20, 30 years. And my hope is part of that evolution can be 
how do we how do we also practice the Jewish uh, value of hospitality? How do we show in a in a service when two people are coming together, one is Jewish, one is not? How do we, we preserve the Jewishness but also incorporate the other? You know, those are things. I mean, they're tough questions, but I do think it's becoming. This isn't an abstract question anymore. When again, it's the same thing I've heard before in the in the Jewish youth context of saying that people have been so afraid of intermarriage. The reality is that ship has sailed. We need to instead be teaching our kids how do you be Jewish and be intermarried? How do you maintain your Jewishness if you marry someone of a different faith? And how do you also Jewishly be ethical and kind to your partner of a different faith? In other words, it's not a Jewish principle to try to proselytize your partner. That's 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 not that's not respectful. That's not a kind way to be. Uh, but we need new rituals. We need new traditions to amplify some of these things and sort some of them out. By the way, in the chat, we had uh, Heather posted. I found this website, 18doors.org, a good resource for interfaith couples. And yes, I, I like that website a lot. And there's some other good ones out there as well. Well, any other thoughts? I, I'm just going to throw this out, Skip. You had, when you came here, you felt it, it's hard for you to feel truly Jewish. And we say, hey, we think you're truly Jewish. You know, we don't have a problem with it. But I think for you, if you have no, if you don't know what all the rituals are really like, it doesn't feel right to you somehow. You don't feel complete. Is that true? Completely Jewish or something. You know what I'm saying? Do you think that that? makes sense to you at all? Yeah, I, I think that there's definitely an element of that. And then, I mean, the cultural, like, you know, I'm I'm a lone man in the wilderness here. Like, I, I could go to reform services, but um, I would probably feel somewhat uncomfortable. And and also, <laughs> I, I don't agree with the, 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 the local reform rabbis' views on a number of different things. And so, like, I'm trying to do this all on my own, and that's what's kind of difficult about it. I think you should say to yourself, why do I want to be Jewish, and why am I Jewish? And then start from there to say, and I need to put a patchwork of rituals together that make me feel Jewish. Because if you don't like what the God-oriented Jews are doing, it's not you for you. And those mm -hmm. rituals are for you, and you don't need to know what they are, really. If, you if need to build issue. up your own Jewish sense of ritual and 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 know why you're doing it and where and why you want to be it. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? I like I like what you said about uh, every kind of asking why do I want to be Jewish. It's important, uh, you know, because why do it at all? You know, if not, yeah. If if you weren't born that way and you're just made that DNA, you know, you 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 know why you did it. But maybe you don't, it's not front of your mind. You know, you're, you're so concerned with doing it and finding it and attending it, whatever. Maybe you need to go back to basics and say, why am I here? And and find the rituals that work for you and put them together and say, there it is. I'm that and I'm doing it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, that's really deep. That's really insightful. Thank you, Paula. I appreciate that. And I, I don't know that I had really considered it from that vantage point. Well, you sort of have to, I think, if you're a convert, because... Why, you know, those of us who are here, we, we don't have to do anything. We're Jewish. We can ignore it completely, which a lot of us had for much of our lives. But then we have to figure out why do we want to start attending? Why do we want to com commune together? But you really have to figure out why you're, especially as you are uncomfortable in the God, in the more God-oriented spaces. You know, some people would just say, I'll just convert through reform and then I'll get all that and then I'll go away. You know, but you don't feel comfortable enough doing that. And I can say I wouldn't feel comfortable doing, enough doing that. And so it's sort of up to you to put your rituals together. And uh, you can ask Martin, you can ask James, you know, uh, for some help or some direction if you want. But it's sort of you have to make it your own. You have to make it you <laughs> because, you're home, because you're picking humanism. You know, that yeah. wouldn't be if you're picking something else. 
And, and actually, it's a good point. I actually had been thinking about recently reaching out to you, James, to ask about how you celebrate certain things or because you had mentioned in the Facebook group about counting the Omer and you were like, no, nah, you can do this humanistically in response to Martin. And uh, I was like, oh, really? Like, I don't I, I kind of ignored counting the Omer because I didn't know anything about it. And also it did kind of seem more theistic in nature. Nobody knows anything about counting Omar. The Omar is very, <laughs> we don't know. We, we've never, we never heard of it before. What is it? What? It's between <laughs> Passover and Shavuot or something. I don't know. You you just you count sheaves of wheat. I have no idea what it's about. <laughs> it, there, are the, creative the ways of, there are creative ways of doing it because one woman I know, she made an Omer quilt for, for each day or something like that, She or week maybe, she made a little square in the quilt. You know, they're just different ways. And you can subscribe to a email where they send you a writing prompt every day of it. I'm still not sure what it means, though. To me, the I've done that before with the writing prompt. But to me, the whole idea of why you do it kind of doesn't resonate. It's like well, a the problem. Calendar, but to what? <laughs> well, here's the problem is that in the old days, they didn't have calendars like we have now. They counted the Omer because it's the only way to keep track of when the next holiday happened. Um, that's really the reason. Uh, beyond that, it's whatever lay, meaning you impose, you lay upon it. And my wife, she really has found a lot. She really likes doing it that's because she's incorporated it as part of the ritual of feeding her dog. So that when she feeds the dog, she then, um, she, I think she says, uh, she does the counting the Omer thing. I think she says the Shema and then she feeds the dog. And it's just become a kind of a ritual, um, which I think is cool. I, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, but it's, it's just a way of incorporating a tiny bit of ritual in the daily life, uh, yeah. you know, but again, it's what, what I like about rituals like that one in particular is it's low stakes. It's something, if you want to do it, great. If you don't, no problem. If not, it's really an extremely, extremely minor thing in the Jewish tradition, but Sometimes it's fun to take these old rituals that may not mean much of anything and delay upon some new meaning on it or using it as an opportunity. I see some value in that, but beyond that, there isn't there really isn't any great meaning behind it at, at, at this at least the surface level. Um, I, I I don't know. I I I was not brought up with traditional or religious rituals, and I just find. I, I just create little things sometimes about little rituals about things that matter to me. Like, for example, when we had when we first started a little compost pile outside and we would have flowers inside, you know, we'd be given flowers and we'd have lovely flowers in the house, whatever. And then they would die. And I I always I, I feel bad when when things die and what do you do? So I started bringing out flowers and when I added them to the compost pile, I would just, I found myself saying one day, thank you so much for gracing us with your beauty. Now you'll help your beautiful things grow. And somehow I started that maybe, I don't know, 10 or 12 yeah, years longer ago, ago longer ago than that, closer to 20 years, I guess, yeah. when we came down to Princeton. Mm -hmm. And I just do that. I still do that when I work with my houseplants, if somebody dies and, and it's going to go outside in the compost. If you ask Martin to come up with a prayer for that, he'll do it. Oh, he would. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Right, <laughs> which you may not want to do, but, but the point but is, I you could do that. that. But to me, yeah. that's like saying a little prayer, a little goodbye, a little eulogy, a, a wish, yes. making them feel better, making me feel better. I don't know, Maybe but you that's feel better. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah me, well, I yeah. love that. That's a lovely idea. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'll give you an example of another ritual I do. I, some of you know that I am, am a cannabis enthusiast. And what I do is in the evenings when I have my nightly smoke, I say a, a blessing. I, I have a humanistic blessing, and I've kind of adapted it from the Hamotzi. So, but instead of saying Hamotzi, like in Minharetz, that makes wheat bread spring up from the earth, I say um, Hamotzi, uh, see, Hamotzi cannabis Minharetz, which makes cannabis spring from the earth. <sighs> but 
kind of connecting it. And for me, though, it's not just, it's not, to me, it's about kind of giving, giving this experience thing. I'm invoking, I'm, I'm wanting to connect it to something bigger than myself. And I'm wanting to open myself up to the experience. And so saying the little blessing gives that intention. And it, magically, it kind of makes the experience different. Now, is that psychological uh, more than anything? Probably so. Who knows? But it's a ritual that I find meaningful. It's a lovely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and it's a I blessing. That. It's, it's a, a, blessing. a blessing, not a prayer. Yes, it's a blessing. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's really lovely. Yeah. But I think there's lots of possibilities of how we can playfully use ritual. And, and also, it's okay to say, this ritual doesn't make sense to me. This ritual has been handed down to me doesn't work for me. Um, you know, for instance, I personally am not a big fan of fasting for any reason whatsoever. I, I recognize its value for many. doesn't work for me. And so I've given myself permission to say, I don't fast. And that's okay. Uh, and that's, we, we have the freedom as humanists and Jews to say, this tradition is meaningful. This one isn't. We can pick and choose. It's okay. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I, I tried. I, I remember trying once when we were in Acton, living in Massachusetts. I tried until I literally was feeling so faint. I remember starting to sort of fall off a couch. And I said, no, this, and, this is not helping yeah. anything or anybody in any way. And I'm and not I allowed to fast. So. I didn't need it. And yeah. Yeah. I thought of, I thought of developing, you know, people will bless their children on Shabbat. I thought of, a, of creating some kind of blessing for our cats. As one of them is 13, she's getting kind of old. I'll look in that thing on ritual wells. If there's any ritual for blessing your cats. Oh, absolutely. Well, I'll, I'll admit that we used to, when my, especially my son was young, we used to bless all the animals at the Shabbat table that we would, and some of them took a little, took a little bit of chasing to be able to bless things, but, uh, it was a lot of fun, and we still do that occasionally. So, I, I did read something today on something like a uh, news place. It says that if you want your cat to like you or whatever, you should blink slowly. So if you're blessing your cat at Shabbat, you should blink slowly at him because that makes him feel oh. you know, like, I don't know. It's mostly scientific. <laughs> I think staring is a, is a challenge to cats. Mm -hmm. And yeah. been, so blinking slowly apparently has the gives the feeling I pre I like you I appreciate you or something. How sweet! Lovely. Good to know. For all the cats we've had, we never knew that. No, no, they were always very. We always had a good yeah. relationship with them. With them, yeah, but we not so much That's a personal lovely. relationship though. That's Maybe true. that creates a more personal relationship. With <laughs> yeah. them. It's a lovely idea. It is. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming on today. Um, I'm going to have to go before long. I have another speaking gig this afternoon, and a little, I'm in, in just a little bit, I have to get ready for. But uh, it's been so good to see everyone today. I'll have the recording up of this uh, the next day or two, and I think we are meeting again in two weeks. Martin is leading that one, and I think it's on the subject of morning rituals, funerals, and morning rituals, and. How do we remember people long term? So I think it should be a really powerful a class. And uh, anyway, I look forward to that a lot. And other than that, um, the only thing I will say, we, you know, I didn't put an assignment or anything in the class discussion for this week. But my suggestion is that if you have a chance, peruse the Ritual Well website. Spend some time with that and see if there's any new rituals you've never considered before or one you might want to play with. And uh, I think that would be kind of maybe a project to do after this. So I encourage you to do that. And other than that, it's great seeing everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, especially Thank for and Betty Ann. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.